Welcome to a special edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series. During this interview, we had the honor of speaking with journeyman jazz bassist and Kansas City's very own Bob Bowman. Born and raised in Kansas City, he made his way from New York City to Los Angeles playing with the best in jazz. He came back to Kansas City in 1988 and has been here ever since and remains a vital part of a very healthy Kansas City jazz scene. During this interview, we covered a large list of questions, including a new album he just released called Songs for Sandra in honor of his late wife. He's very open about all things jazz and how he views his career from yesterday, today, and into tomorrow. Dig it, my friends. Now I'm just going to go ahead and dive right in here. Let me kind of start out at the beginning of your life. Tell me where you were. T tell me where you were born and raised. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in Topeka, Kansas. Was there anything specific about Topeka that kind of lent to you getting into jazz? Yeah, actually, there was, and they have a a jazz workshop series there. Of, at that time, this is like in the 60s, um, they had a, it was kind of like a weekend warrior musicians that some of them pretty good and a couple of good arrangers and they had a big band that would, would uh, they'd play the arrangements and stuff, you know, and once in a while they'd have a little concert and then they kind of evolved into getting involved in the schools a little bit and they started the junior jazz workshop, so like the best kids in the high school there were six high schools in the area and then um uh, so that that was kind of a push, and then out of that, they uh, they'd play a concert, and then they pick, you know, they thought the best deserving or whatever. Uh, they go to a Stan Kenton clinic and, and for a week, you know, or, or a jazz camp thing. And uh, so I, I I got to that when I was fifteen. And I was already playing some gigs and stuff that opened up my eyes pretty big right then. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that I just heard, I'd heard Oscar Peterson's trio at Kansas University, and so that was amazing. And oh, yeah. I went to this, and then the bass player at the time hit me that Scott Mafaro. That was kind of pretty much all she wrote. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, I just listened to that album at the uh, Village Vanguard with Bill Evans recently, the one right before oh. he had that accident. That was an amazing album. Yeah, it, is. it still is. It just blows me away. Yeah, and and wore out three copies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's the way to do it, man. That's the way to do it. Um, so you started out on the piano, moved on to the clarinet, and then landed on the bass. Why did that lineage go the way it did? Uh, a friend of my parents uh, had a Pete Fountain. Well, they're like Pete Fountain, so they gave me a Pete Fountain album. I, I kind of, I think I sort of like bass. I heard it on like. Oh, not really so much jazz. They didn't have much jazz around, but uh, but, that, but then I, I heard uh, this Pete found him the thing, and there was a bass solo on the St. Louis Blues. <laughs> <laughs> it's a guy named Morty Corb, <laughs> and, uh, and I remember, hey, that's what I want to play. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was kind of interesting. Yeah, that's that cool. Happened. So I was I was like, oh, I probably was eleven, man, and I got my first bass. And I was, which is also kind of interesting because we had uh, a Dalmatian and uh, they bred her and she had 10 puppies. And so I took care of them and raised them and uh, sold some of them and the money I made up on my first day. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. Very cool. That's a great story. Very cool. So let me talk to you. Let me talk to you about this. So we kind of talked about Topeka, the Stan Kenton Jazz Clinic, and then you moved on North Texas State University. What was that experience like there? Really diving into a university environment. Well, yeah, that was sort of. I kind of made the connection through the Kenton Clinic because a lot of the guys in the band had been through that school. My parents liked the idea of going to college. <laughs> Died it too, actually. Sure. But yeah, it was a, it was a great time to be there. I was there. At the, uh, it was just a lot of good players and, and uh, there wasn't uh, there was just a strictly dick band and that was mostly about sight reading and breeding uh, studio musicians it seemed like you know but yeah outside of that we we sometimes would play three sessions a day and, and there were guys like uh, both bass players were Scott uh, Dennis Irwin was there and Mark Johnson was there at the same time and uh, Steve Houghton and drummers and John Riley was there and Lyle Mays was there and a whole slew of people so 
that, that was pretty amazing that we were all there at the same time. So let me kind of go back a little bit before North Texas. Your first professional live jazz gig, what was it like? Were you nervous? Did it feel natural for you? What was it like? <laughs> well, I suppose, uh, oh gosh, probably the way I eased into it was playing like the nice of Columbus and stuff with guys, you know. But we play some dumb tunes and then, you know, like play like Bye Bye Blackbird and Indiana and things like that. Yeah. Kind of getting closer to the jazz thing. And then, the, oh, I, actually, one of the first gigs I had was three, three of his high school buddies. And uh, we all, we were like the only three in our school. We had, had a jazz band in our school, but it was, you know, you had to eat, uh, meet at uh, 7 a.m. or something outside of school. And, like two days a week, but so we had a, a trio, uh, trombone, bass, and drums. And uh, as I recall, about every tune we played was a D flat. <laughs> That's but, funny. Uh, but the, yeah, the, so it wasn't really a, a definitive first gig. You know, uh, I played the you know in our high school band did go to some festivals and stuff. And I remember going to one of Rich Madison's one of the clinicians, and he was, it was real complimentary. And I'm like, oh gosh, my life. <laughs> I think I can play, you know. Is it? So, but I guess you know. I guess I got with a trio, another trip with the pianist. They were all older and really good. And we were playing like uh, we play Bill Evans and Brubeck stuff, and then we would throw him Alley Cat or some dude, at, you know, at the country clubs. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we managed to work, and we, we they got pretty good money, you know. And I could play one gig, and it was as much as my friends were making. And, working with McDonald's in two weeks, you know? Yeah, yeah, you know, that's cool. now they're all doctors. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's, let's move to the L.A. part of your life. So you go to L.A., you get experience with Thad Jones, the Mel Lewis Orchestra, Toshiko Akiyoshi, Lou Tabak, and, and, and his big band. What, what was that like, to get in front of a bigger crowd, you know, these kind of, uh, these brilliant musicians on stage? What did you learn? What was all that like? Well, actually, the first thing I did was the, with that Jones and Lewis in New York. That was a that was the real eye opener there. Like I kind of went from North Texas. I had like a year where I didn't go to school, and I was I lived, playing in Portland, Oregon, for a kind of steady gig, and then I moved back to Dallas and worked around there for a little bit. And then a drummer friend of mine hooked me up with Mel when they were looking for a bass player, and he gave me a tape, and so they asked me to come up and play. And I'm not thinking I'm going to get the gig or anything, but Someone got me a bunch of their charts, and I kind of knew some of their music pretty well anyway. And, and uh, so I ended up uh, playing. The, my audition was at the Vanguard on Monday night, you know. But I don't know. I didn't even think about it, you know. I remember I just think, wow, you know, this is where Scott Lafaro and Bill Evans played, and Coltrane yeah. and all these guys, you know. That was cool, but I didn't really get nervous. I yeah. Why? Hmm. But then, but I, I remember just playing it first set or so and, and Mel was he's pretty opinionated and didn't hold back and so he you know told me all the things I was doing wrong and I was thinking well at least I'm learning a lot and then at, at the end of this conversation he goes, oh by the way you got your gig <laughs> 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 so, but you know right then and there like in you know for, you know one set I learned more than I did it the whole time at North Texas wow wow <laughs> not that I didn't learn anything down there but it was just amazing you know I remember playing with Mel the first time I said oh my gosh I want every gig I play to feel like this you know so you came back to Kansas City in 1988 why why did you come back um well that time I was living in, in LA I don't know I never really thought I'd live in LA but I even looked at that gig with the uh, Toshiko and so that was kind of through Mel Lewis actually but uh, that's why I lived out there and I just I just always liked the Midwest or you know, around Kansas and Kansas City and my parents basically they were getting older and they were just wonderful parents and I just kind of felt like oh, I want to be with them as they're getting older you know yeah because my, my sisters were out on the west coast as well so I, so I figured I could it seemed like what the scene was like in LA they were you know good players and chorus great players and there was quite a few gigs they didn't pay very well mm -hmm. and the cost of living is a lot more and it realized Gigs actually paid better in Kansas City, and, and you know, cost of living's not. There's not the, the, the depth of players, but the, the few that really good ones are really good, you know. So uh, that, that's you know, knew that I could probably you know make a living. That, at least that's what I was doing in L.A. Once I quit being on the road, I just played around L.A. and it seemed like Kansas City was probably a better place to be. Sure. 
sure. And it's definitely turned out to be by now, for sure. It's, it's really good here right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to get to that here in the next couple questions. But what what I want to know when you came back as kind of this uh, well journeyed midwestern jazz musician that went to LA and New York when you came back what was the reception like did it was it easier to get gigs was there kind of this um you know kind of history that helped you get more gigs well in a way and in, in a way it was like uh, some of the people they kind of put up a, a little wall or something well he's just, you know from LA he thinks he can come in here and you know play that just just because he lived out there he plays better and so and I, I probably played a little too modern for some of these guys, <laughs> you know, and, and I didn't really adjust. And <laughs> most of them were gone now, anyway. But uh, but it, it was it was good. It was basically good. But there was there were some you know guys that you could feel like a little resistance. You know, and, and I think a lot of it kind of had to do with they never actually went out left this area or tried to you know do it elsewhere, which I think is an excellent thing to do. I mean. Kind of in a relatively small scene, and that's all you know. I think it's. I, just, I noticed the difference with the guys that have. And there's quite a few of them here that have gone out and made names for themselves and then stayed back, <laughs> and then come back. I mean, and uh, I think that was some of those guys never did that, and that was probably. They're frustrated, I should say, probably. So, so let me ask you this. This was the question I promised I was going to get back to. These days, Kansas City is going through quite a jazz renaissance surge with Herman Mahari and all these young guys out there under, you know, coming out of Bobby Watson's program at UMKC. What is that like? How do you feel about, you know, playing with these young guys and, and the Kansas City scene these days? I, I love it. I, I love playing with these young guys. Young guys. I would Last night I just stopped by the Majestic and Herman was playing and there happened to be a whole bunch of guys there, you know, at least 20, most, one guy might have been 20 years younger than me and everybody else is younger than that. <laughs> <laughs> but they, 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 they love me, I love them and I play with them and I hire them and they hire me and, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to, you know, keep my game up, you know, keep, keep up with these guys and, yeah. and they, they respect my experience and, and Yeah, interesting. I've had a chance to really listen to this, and my first impression, which is when you really go with your gut, is this is a very, it sounds awfully personal and cathartic, and I read the Jam article that Michael Schultz wrote, and I get the feeling that, I guess that's my question to you, was this album really a catharsis for you? Oh man, I never thought of it that way, but probably so, yeah. This is definitely, I kind of, I wanted to do something. My own. I've done a couple of interstring albums, which were, that was pretty much my band, but it wasn't like my name was on it. And this one was like, I wanted a normal departure. And, and I, I, I've been playing with Roger Wilder, which I absolutely love, and I wanted to explore that. So that's kind of the bulk of the thing. It's mostly Roger and I and Todd. And, and piano is a lot of more piano than my previous stuff. But the, I think, yeah, it was a plan to songs for Sandra it was you know like, just the idea of some of those tunes you probably didn't know but it's the way we played them uh, there's some some of the tunes that I like the very thought of you I never cared for that tune very much until Laura Caviani just started playing it <clears throat> and so all of a sudden I just we just played it and that was the take <laughs> yeah so okay I guess I like this tune after all yeah. <laughs> it seemed they're like really fit you know and it was an interesting way to do a recording because I, could, you know, I really don't care what people think about it. <laughs> right. You know? So uh, and it's probably the best way to do it. You know? Yeah, it's a great album. In fact, on a day like today, this is the ideal album for me just to sit back and just take it all in. It's just, it, 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 it's, it's a great listen, and I'm looking forward to hearing it more, and I'm going to spin yeah. it on my show. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a couple, you know, things where we can, we can get the roar and pretty good on it, and Roger is just, he actually set himself, which is unusual. It's his best play. He's a 
but like he's done nice and free to say that's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's cool. So in your in the jam article that Schultz wrote, you had mentioned that people get kind of funny asking you about Sandra, and I felt your answer was really spot on where you were like, I don't get that. I don't have any problems talking about it. Kind of elaborate a little bit on that for me. Well, I, I guess I, I, it's just uh, I, 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 don't, I don't understand why you wouldn't want to talk about it. Uh, I mean, I could, you know, at first it you know, it'd be hard because you know, kind of break down, of course. But but uh, I don't know. It's part of the process of going through something like that, and, uh, uh, like it, doing the, this recording, and uh, we also establish this scholarship fund in her name it's like I don't know it's just it's a real tribute and just you know it's almost if she's still here and while well, she is in spirit of course but it, uh, but yeah so I don't have a problem of you know, it's almost like a, I suppose enough, if there were you went in a, a relationship like in that way and something was not right in the relationship or something that, be <laughs> different, you know. Yeah. But because I've seen that happen, but uh, you know, we went through our rough times and we weren't having that at all. Yeah. Even except for her health, but uh, but, it, but yeah, it, it's and, and definitely it's you know it's definitely affects my music for sure. I mean, just and not consciously, but you just think, you know, why I just I play different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. Absolutely. It leave things out that I wouldn't. I would normally kind of play by muscle memory or something. You know, it's like but now I'm aware of them. Wow. Well. Yeah. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Uh, so. Let me let me kind of switch tracks here a little bit and ask you. You played with luminaries like Carmen McRae, Freddie Hubbard, and Bud Shank. What did these individuals that were so well versed and so big in the jazz world teach you? Not only about jazz, but about life. Uh, well, where I spent most time was with Carmen and uh, unfortunately she was a very unhappy person and uh, although she was funny as it could be and uh, we always we got along really well and uh, the, uh, the drummer Mark Police and I don't know she seems like wanted to hang out with us and stuff you know but, okay. uh, but uh, you didn't want to go to a restaurant with her because she's just heck you know just hell on it on the servers and like that. Oh no! <laughs> yeah. yeah, but 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 you, no, you, 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 you she'd start telling stories, and, and uh, especially if she was around somebody. I remember one time we were around with Roy Haynes, and they just started going into stories. And, oh man, it was just incredible hearing you know from these people. You know, and you're just laughing. You know, it's just like stories that we go through now. You know, that happen things that happen now, and but they were talking about it. We of course, so at that point, to me, they looked like oh, this is like. It's a huge history, which it really was. But yeah, you know, but you know, as you could tell, she she loved to sing. She loved to sing, and but she she hated being out on the road and all that. She just wanted to be home with her her big standard poodle, uh, Alfie, <laughs> <laughs> which she had more than one, and they were all named Alfie. <laughs> <laughs> nice, <laughs> very nice. Um, yeah, but but Shank was uh, he was different because he just he, he was he did not a man a lot of words or anything. But uh, I don't know how we met. It was at Dante's something. I think it was that maybe his man. I'm not sure. But all of a sudden he hired me for some really important gigs, and, and I was like, wow, this is pretty neat, you know? Yeah. And then then he kind of ended up moving up to Seattle and just kind of staying up there in that area up there. And, Salem, Iowa, I guess it is. So he kind of, kind of left LA, but that that was a pretty big impact. And, and Freddie, I didn't really have much contact with him. And I mean, I felt like I was just this kind of a sub. But he he never really had a set band. It wasn't like I was subbing for anybody. It was just like the band was never really set. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, no, I hear you. So, but, but you know, what I would say, you know, just like the playing level was huge. It was just so high and. Uh, the energy was just amazing, you know, just right out of the chute, you know, don't fuck me. Yeah. You, know, you better be good and warmed up. Yeah, right. She did not do. <laughs> <laughs> She'd pick up the horn and pull out a jacket case and 
Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So, if there's anybody in the world of jazz, whether here with us or not, who would you like to have played with and talked to? Oh, I just thought it was Bill Evans, and I got really close to that happening, too, and then he died. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I was friends with Mark, because of North Texas, Mark Johnson, and uh, uh, he kind of hooked it up to him for me to and I'd get the gig we'd come and play with Bill on that Sunday afternoon at the Vanguard and then Bill died yeah so that was that you know that well that was so that was so close and I you know that's the first name that comes to mind plus I just always love the music sure sure but, but I suppose you could dig back and also you know Scott Farrell for instance just yeah. he lived such a short life it'd be interesting to know what that guy was like and then I did have lunch with, well, I'm not just me, with, with uh, Count Basie, but it was with Thad Jones and, and uh, some jazz festival or uh, all of it. And, uh, and I remember just sitting there and just not saying a word, and, and he was just hilarious. He just, <laughs> he just laughed the whole time. <laughs> just one sentence after another was just bring you to your knee. <laughs> That's but, nice. you know, people like that, you know, like Mingus or someone like that would be interesting to know. They'd be probably pretty frightening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, it's just, you know, it'd be, it'd be interesting to play with or know people of that caliber and that time and so forth. Sure, sure. It was really, music was really forming, you know. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, what's the nicest thing a fan has ever said to you? Oh, well, uh, I suppose I'm getting exactly say it particularly but it's happened a few times, especially of late. It's like you know, I feel like but that was they just had a spiritual experience or something like that along that with those lines, you know. Uh, those to that to me is like the ultimate compliment. Yeah. You know, it was like, hey man, you got some great shots. Well yeah, but did have did, did you feel better? <laughs> yeah. Now when you when you got here or are you just depressed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Sure, sure. Um what has inspired you all these years to continue making jazz music? What What is it about you? What is it about jazz? What is it? Oh, it's, I'd say number one is the musicians and the people you get to play with and what an incredible people they are for the most part. I mean, most of them are just very giving and, of course, really smart. Yeah. And uh, that, I mean, that, and then to, to, especially when you play with close friends, uh, and, and some people like Danny Ambry, you know, I've known for, played with more than anybody for you know, about 40 years, and, and to still make it happen, like, you know, it's still fresh. I mean, that's just, all oh, that keeps you going, like, you know, it's not going to, but I think it, it has to do with, say, say, for instance, Danny and I just are, we both are kind of still, you know, trying to get better, you know? Yeah. And uh, I think so. You got to have that, too, but that, that you know, I think that, that being the, around the musicians, and, 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 you know, the true, true fans, of course, you know, that really like to get the spiritual part of it, you know, that's, wow, that keeps you going for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you just had a, 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 an album come out. You've been steady throughout your career. What What is left for you to accomplish? What do you want to continue doing for the years to come? And what, what, what do you want to ultimately accomplish in the realm of music and jazz? I probably could put this in words, but it just, uh, and then a lot of this is kind of stuff that's been in my mind since when I was old, my early to late 20s. And it seems like life got in the way for a few decades. And, and uh, um, this honor was very, a very huge fan, and big supporter. She was always, at, you know, if she could be there, she was out more than any other musician's girlfriend or wife, you know. And, uh, when she died, it, it certainly like, made me like uh, kind of think way back to what I really wanted to, uh, you know, what I was thinking, and just you know, more creative, I suppose. Because sometimes, uh, so the one thing that can happen in Kansas City that has happened, it gets too stuck in the tradition. It was the creative side or side of it. But, but right now, uh, of course, so many of the younger guys. Things are pretty fresh, but just myself personally, I've just felt like, wow, like I haven't felt in decades, you know. So it's like things I'm trying to achieve, and 
Yeah. Just, you know, it's just kind of the same thing, just trying to just move people. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to play, I'd like to go back to, uh, I'd love to tour some other countries again and be older and <laughs> more experienced and have it a little bit more under my control, you know, say, not just say my own band, but, you know, of, of a group of my own friends and do it that way without any uh, stardom surrounding it. Because there was always a little of that with most of the names. It was just a little, not necessarily them, but the way they were treated by yeah. people who were playing for or working for, you know. Sure. So there's always a little separation, but it would be nice to just kind of go to, you know, I'd love to go back to Europe and Australia and uh, Japan for sure. Yeah. And in a different, you know, having, being, being a lot older and <laughs> so forth. And sure. Yeah, I hear the level of appreciation for jazz in Japan is really off the charts. Yeah, and, and, just, and the knowledge, you know. <laughs> yeah. Just, just strike up a conversation that they have these jazz coffee houses, which are actually kind of bars and they play, you know, records, you know, LPs. Yeah. And now I've kind of just been a and 15 years since I've been there, I suppose. But, uh, but yeah, you strike up a conversation. Somebody can hardly speak English, and I can hardly speak any Japanese. And, and you know, oh, Tommy Flanagan, or, you know, certain kind of not a household jazz name, but they know them. Yeah. You know? And they know the recordings and stuff. It's like, yeah. wow. <laughs> so that's pretty interesting. That's cool. That's very that cool. That happened a lot. I mean, it wasn't just like once in a while, but it happened a lot. <laughs> yeah. And that's cool. That's very cool. Oh, it is, yeah. You've been in Kansas City a long time. What's the greatest thing about Kansas City? I suppose the, the, the size is probably perfect. For, it's, I mean, it's, for me personally, it's actually a bigger city than I'd like to live in. But, but uh, no, it's about as small as you can get and still have a scene. And, uh, and it's a good one. And I think, you know, once again, it has to do with the musicians that are here right now. It's a real good thing. And the way that it, it's... The city's kind of like, kind of always touted itself a jazz town, but it hasn't always been one that's my, my, you know, observation. But but uh, it, it seems to be right now kind of, you know, it's very conducive. I mean, there's quite a few places to play. I mean, it's never going to be like huge or you no know, places anymore. I don't, I don't think we'll ever see the, the data of, you know, so many clubs and used to play all these gigs, you know, six, seven nights a week. You know, those days are gone. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but uh, there, there's this, it's just conducive to, like I mentioned earlier, just there's a real warmth in the positions. And, and it seems like the audience is really, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of more serious about it. You know, it used to be kind of party, kind of related more to blues and you know, always jazz. Oh, I just love jazz and blues. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not that I don't like the blues or anything, but, it, but the party atmosphere is, Kind of, it's kind of taken, moved a little bit. Now it's more people go in to actually sit and listen to music. And if you don't, you're kind of, you know, what is he talking for? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? Right. And of course, Sonder was the worst about it. If anybody talking, <laughs> she would get on him right away. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Funny. So. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I've heard a lot of stories about musicians that get crazy when people are talking. They'll they'll stop a set, or they'll uh, call someone out on the carpet. So, yeah. yeah I, mean, I, don't, I don't condone that at all. Car- Carmen McRae could do that. Oh, man. I tell you, the people, she'd sing out the table what was doing it, and pretty soon she'd have everybody else in the room against them, and they'd inevitably leave. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I bet. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um. Let, let's say in about 10 to 20 years from now, you're sitting back and you're thinking about your life and music. What do? You, how do you want the world to remember Bob Bowman's contribution to it? Well, I don't know if it, I was a you know, positive person, positive force, I suppose, more than anything. Help people along the way or something. I looked to this guy, a classical bassist uh, in France, uh, Francois Robot. And he's, uh, he's uh, I guess he's about 85 now. And he just plays incredibly. So that's, you know, that's a little more than 20 years old than me. And uh, I look at him and say, wow, it's a 
amazing, you know, just physically still being able to play the bass as, as effortlessly as he does the bass, yeah. you know, it's amazing. And, and he is so very, he's just a warm, warm, warm guy, and uh, we've done these uh, bass uh, workshops, and we've done one of the, a couple up here in Kansas City, a bunch of guys that put a bunch of hard, Jeff Harshbarger's involved, and, uh, and it's only ham on the classical guys and, and then they also do it up in Minneapolis but bring Francois over and, and he's got his own little following but it's amazing we had just so many people that just uh, cared for it's a week long thing and it's amazing <laughs> but you look I look at someone like that and I think that's a real that's a, you know it's just a real strong I, mean, I want to be looked at like that yeah like this, you know? yeah absolutely you know, I'm still doing it 20 years that's what I'd like to be I look at I played with Claude Williams up until you know, well he died, which we all thought he was gonna make it to Henry, but he didn't play it. But yeah. uh, pretty much he was he was on top of his game until the very end he started getting forgetful. He'd call a tune and and realize it and we'd say, Well, we just played it. <laughs> so, yeah. and, uh, or sometimes he'd catch himself too, you know. But uh, but it was the kind of, you know I also don't want to uh, Play beyond my ears, and I could, like an athlete that stays on too long. Yeah, you know? but but when I look at Francois, he's definitely not playing beyond his ears. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Bob. Thanks again for your time today. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, uh, thank you for doing it. Thanks for listening and tuning into a very special Neon Jazz interview session where we give you a bit of insight into the legends and all of those cats that give us that jazz. And thanks to the great Bob Bowman for his time and love of jazz. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store or visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things Neon Jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.